Howdy folks, welcome back to Steampunk Death Retro channel. Today I'm talking about a series that spawned a streaming series that is all the rage right now. It's Silo on Apple TV Plus, but I'm not going to talk about that. I'm going to talk about the books that inspired it. Because I'm kind of a purist. I like to read the book first. So this will be a review of those books without having seen any of those shows. Now, when I first heard about the book Wool by Hugh Howey, I was intrigued. And this is the first book in the Silo series. The concept was interesting, but I didn't look into it at the time. There's a lot of stuff to read, and you just don't know what's going to be good and what's not. Only after I heard it had been picked up by Apple TV Plus did I decide to read it. And when I did, I thought, yeah, I like this, and I read the next two. Since it came out this June in Apple TV Plus, a lot of you probably know the premise already, but I will give you a recap for those who aren't familiar in just a bit. First, a little bit about the author. Hugh Howey is self-published. That's how he did the Silo series. He had had a few books before, a few YA books that didn't attract a lot of attention, I don't think, from a small publisher. But this time, he put it online and it became a bestseller. Now, this was 2011, which is just one year before I published my first book, Centrifugal Force, which, <laughs> unfortunately, like 99% of self-published books hasn't been that much of a hit. So Howie is an interesting character. He's worked in many, many occupations, and maybe that's why he has such insight to write interesting books with interesting characters. A variety of experience, I'd say. Uh, he's Besides these YA novels, he's also written The Sand Chronicles, which came afterward, and, and a bunch of short stories. Some more that happened in the Silo universe, and some more that didn't. I've also just looked at his blog on HughHowie.com, and he's had some interesting and exciteful things to say about AI, uh, which I will also do a show about that eventually. I will, I promise. So I love the way he did this. He published all these things as succeeding novellas and short stories, and then after they were all out, he cobbled them together. It's called, you know, serial publication, and that's something that was popular way back in the 1800s. Charles Dickens did that. That was how people first read David Copperfield. You know, it was in The Strand or some other magazine, I forget which, and they would read it every month. They would be looking forward to the next chapter. <laughs> it takes a lot of discipline to be able to write that way because you can easily go off on a limb. It's almost like you have to have the whole thing done, but you still, <laughs> until the very time that you release it, you're still worrying as an author, did I make the right decision? <laughs> and it's easier to go all at once, so I applaud him for that. One more word of warning. There are more than one silo video instances online. Uh, one of them came out in 2010, and it's actually about a rural town in, in uh, America somewhere where some guy's being drowned in grain. <laughs> Normal type of tragedy in the kind of place I come from. Another one was released in 2020, and it has a similar post-apocalyptic setup as Hugh Howey's series, but it doesn't sound nearly as good or original. Haven't seen it. Can't say. Just from the description. Now, here is the setup. Wool is a post-apocalyptic novel that involves a city. It takes place in a city of about 10,000 or so people. Not sure exactly how many. They live in an underground silo. It has over 100 levels where people perform all the functions necessary for a self-contained economy. You know, they've got power generation and environmental controls. They have hydroponic farms for food, they have water recycling, education for the young, and so on. Air purification, because the outside is toxic. <laughs> Nobody knows how long the silo has existed and how many generations have been born and died there and you know why the outside is poisoned. Uh, it's just a deadly wasteland. 
And there is only one punishment for serious crimes, which is exile. <laughs> so they don't have room for jails other than a couple cells for rowdy drunks, you know. If you do a serious crime, you are put outside, and that is a death sentence. The people who are condemned to go outside, they're given a task, a final task. They're given this pad of wool, which is the name that the book comes from, and told to clean the lenses of the cameras that show them the outside world. Because it's deadly, you're not going to go out there unless you're going to die. <laughs> and so they all do it. You would think they would thumb their noses at the society and say, ha ha, I'm not going to do it. But they always do, which is another minor mystery for the story. And even though they're in this kind of space suit, the air just kind of dissolves the seals and they go on, they walk up the hill after they clean and they collapse and die where they stand or where they lay. That's the premise. Now, the three novels take place within this world with different timelines. The first book is a mystery where the characters are trying to, at first, solve a possible murder. It's a kind of a suspicious death, which leads them to the darkest series, the darkest secrets, that is, of the silo. Since book one reveals so many of these secrets at the end, I can't talk about books two and three without giving some spoilers. And book three the most, because book two has a few more secrets in it. I'll try to give away as little as possible, but I can't really talk about the other books at all without giving some. It, it's a complicated world, and in order to give any kind of summary that's not just a teaser, uh, you have to talk about them. And anyway, Wikipedia does a total spoiler summary of it, as they always do. So, book one, Wool, was published serially in parts in 2011 through 2012, and then aggregated into one. Now, Simon & Schuster has the rights to distribute it in paper form at bookstores around the world. But Howie, so crazy like a fox as he is, kept the rights to online distribution. <laughs> And he got only half a million for it. Oh, only half a million. And he turned down multi-million dollar contracts because he's going to keep control. Good for him. The story begins in the silo at an unknown time in the future as the sheriff of the silo is struggling to discover what made his wife go crazy and uh, go outside. <laughs> and she was, you know, sentenced. She violated the biggest taboo, which is talking about leaving. They have a folk saying, you get what you ask for. Sounds like an old Western, doesn't it? And as the folk saying goes, and anyway, the sheriff's wife was with the IT department, the computer guys. And that's the organization that actually runs the silo. Unlike the mayor, who is just a titular head. I mean, this mayor is elected, but... She doesn't really do that much. Uh, kisses babies and cuts ribbons and kind of that kind of thing. Now, the sheriff is convinced that the wife was onto something and that the view they're showing through the cameras is false. So he decides he wants to leave. So, of course, they oblige him. But he discovers to his dismay that it is toxic and he does die. <laughs> uh, collapses on the, on the slope with the corpse of his wife. Now here is where the real protagonist comes into play. Her name is Juliet Nichols. She's a mechanic from the lower levels and there are 144 of them. <laughs> and so it's crazy. Uh, you would think it would start to get a little too dense down there with the air. But she's one of those faithful people who keep the silo running. For some bizarre reason, the mayor decides that she's going to choose Juliet as a successor to the sheriff, though she has no law enforcement experience. Now, this is because the sheriff worked with her to solve a case a couple years back, and he was so impressed. He couldn't stop talking about how smart she was, you know, and how clever, whatnot. So the mayor says, yes, we're going to pick her. And she's out of her depth, poor Juliet, because there's nobody to shadow with. There's nobody to apprentice because the sheriff is dead. At this point, we learn that the real ruler of the silo is, of course, the head of IT, a sinister man called Bernard. <laughs> and he's at odds with Juliet as she's struggling to, you know, make sense of things. 
they really know a lot that they're not telling. And Juliet wonders, as the sheriff's dead wife did, why does the, the silo undergo periodic rebellions and revolts every you know, few generations? They're horrible, bloody rebellions, and they're always put down, and the instigators are put outside to die, which makes some people happy because births are strongly regulated, and now all a bunch of people get to have babies. <laughs> anyway... Why did this happen? Why did these never succeed? And why doesn't the silo actually get destroyed in this chaos? I mean, you could think that they'd open the seals and let in the poison air. But so far, this hasn't happened. But, of course, Juliet is worried about this sort of thing. Eventually, she learns too much, and she sends to go out to clean. She's kind of framed for a crime she didn't commit. She learns a little bit more about how these people die and so she has an advantage when she goes outside. And what happens when she does surprises everybody. So I'm not going to say any more about this first book, but it's fun. It's a lot of very intriguing and very absorbing narrative. Book two is called Shift, another one word title. And how he loves these, you know, wool, shift, and dust. Then he has a series called Sand. <laughs> Great, isn't it? Shift was published serially between 2012 and 2013. This book was partly a prequel of book one. And we learn how the silo originated as a top-secret defense project. It's located outside Atlanta in rural Fulton County, Georgia, in this huge field. <laughs> the protagonist of this book is, is Congressman Donald Keene, and he's just been elected. He is a former architect who was uh, mentored by this grizzled old war veteran, uh, Senator Thurman, who helped him get elected. And one of the things Thurman is spearheading this project, the secret project, to provide a place for nuclear waste. And as a aside, they're also going to put this facility for disaster survival. At first they say it's because, oh, the nuclear waste containment might fail and the technicians have to go in for a couple of weeks till the hotness of the place dies down. But eventually, Donald knows that it's actually, they're worried about nuclear war or some other disaster, you know, plague or that sort of thing. So because he's an architect, he is in charge of the design of this habitat silo. Now, it seems counterintuitive that they put this right next to the waste silos, but we find out more that it's not. <laughs> And part two starts when they're actually completing, they've actually completed these silos, and the Democratic National Convention is happening at this site. <laughs> Why? How he picks on the Democrats, I'm not sure, one way or another. But coincidentally, right when they're celebrating, right when they're touring these facilities, a missile attack from some mysterious aggressor just happens at the exact right time when they're all there. And they all get herded down into these 50 different silos. Now, you would think, well, some of them were just waste disposal, weren't they? Well, not exactly. There is habitat in all of these silos. The next portion of Part 2 happens when Donald wakes up in a cold sleep capsule many, many years later. They have put most of the inhabitants to sleep to wait out the disaster for the outside to become breathable again. And they have a skeleton crew manning the silo, keeping everybody alive. They're awake in six-month shifts, hence the name. And they get put to sleep again. And so it has been decades, actually. Now, Donald is very upset to learn that his wife was in a different silo. And he can't communicate with her. In any case, she might be asleep. He doesn't know much. They don't tell them much at first. And in fact, no women are awake at, in, at this time. They're all asleep because they figure, oh, the men will fight over the women if we have any of them awake, if there's any kind of imbalance. In a way, it makes sense because we are kind of all cavemen really at heart. Donald is like slowly forgetting, you know, they make him take pills to ease the pain of, you know, all this loss. But at the same time, he's slowly remembering and, and it makes him 
suspect that there's something wrong, and he has to find out, and he has to investigate what Thurman was really up to, who is also in this silo, by the way, <laughs> and also serving his shifts. Now, as we move on to book three, we're going to have even more spoilers, so you have been warned. Book three is called Dust. It was published in One Piece in 2013, and this brings the narratives together. At the end of book one, the inhabitants of the first silo, uh, led by Juliet, actually found out, find out a lot more. Juliet is able to reach another silo, which is almost empty, and they died during their revolt, and there's just a few survivors, and she is able to help them, and then she says, I'm going to come back and help you, but she leaves and goes back to her silo in her one good spacesuit. Now, at the end of book two, the people of that silo, which is actually silo 17, 17 out of 50, have actually become aware of silo one and how they've been manipulating everything. And uh, they've actually been communicating, and Julia has sworn revenge. She believes that, that silo one is responsible for all this disaster, for keeping them underground for all these many decades, even centuries, and for allowing these revolts and mass death to happen. And some of the silos are, in fact, completely dead, <laughs> having been opened up and the poison gas came in, everybody died. <laughs> so, well, this is a story that ping-pongs back and forth between Juliet and her friends as she's trying to prepare, uh, just in case Silo 1 tries to kill them all. <laughs> and uh, Donald, who is struggling with his conscience and with the evil machinations of Thurman and uh, trying to figure out how to make amends for what he's done. And so the name Dust, now that may come from the dust in the hellscape outside. I mean, there's wind blowing with dust all the time. Or it may come from the chemical poison that uh, Silo 1 has inside the silos hidden so that they can exterminate the people of any silo who rebels. So it's kind of a sinister plot at the end, isn't it? Pros and cons. All three books have the same narrator for the audiobook version, and he's very good, Eduardo Ballerini. I really appreciate him. The world building is fabulous, amazing, very detailed, and it seems like he's thought of everything. Book one in particular is a fascinating mystery, which is not just political, but also technological. In a number of cases, the author actually surprised me. This is very rare. They have engaging, complex character. Juliet, in particular, she's a strong female woman, but she's not a strong female woman. She's a strong, uh, she's a strong empowered woman, let's say. <laughs> and she's not superwoman, though. She can't, like, beat up men like they do in these badly written modern uh hero stories. No. She is a very smart woman who uses her intelligence to her advantage and her ability to make alliances with other people. Donald, too, is a very conflicted and tragic character. He's been led to do some very bad things, and he is horribly guilty for it, which leads him to do even more bad things. But he keeps trying to, you know, achieve uh, forgiveness or closure or whatever, you know, whatever the term is. Thurman, too, is an interesting villain, <laughs> I must say. And they have some other fascinating characters that I'm not going to go into. The author leaves racial descript descriptions kind of vague in most cases, which is good because that allows him to cast anybody as anything <laughs> in, in, the, uh, in the actual series. And you can see that it is very diverse. The third book is the most exciting. It's a race against time. It's with all these people that you've been come, you've come to know and root for, and other people you root against. <laughs> and it does kind of end on a hopeful note. And Wikipedia notes that uh, he has left room for a sequel and does plan one at some point. Now, one more thing I have to note because I was on one of the sites, one of the channels where they're talking about the trailers and so on of the series, the Apple TV Plus series. 
And people are complaining, oh, it's the same old plot. The government's behind everything, blah, 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 blah. You know, we want something different. Well, it is a little different and it's a little bit more complicated <laughs> than you might think. And you keep going back and forth. Well, is it really all dead or isn't it? So I have to say that he did do a good job incorporating something different. Cons. There are a few, as everything does. Much of the series is depressing, especially if you're claustrophobic, and I'm a little claustrophobic. It kind of is a little bit upsetting <laughs> reading some of this stuff. There are so many characters to keep track of. That can be a little bit of a problem. That is something that kind of is one of my pet peeves. But he does handle it fairly well. The second book has some slow pacing. In a way, that's appropriate because it takes place over centuries, but I still found it a bit tedious at times. After the first book, most of the good mysteries are solved, which is a little disappointing. There's still a few at the end of the second book that you find out. Finally, the villain Thurman, he has very few of any redeeming qualities. You keep thinking, maybe he does? You found out, yeah, he really doesn't. <laughs> and so you, you never quite find out whether how much Thurman is plugged into the real government. You know, what is it Thurman who's solely responsible? Well, he has a couple associates, but that kind of makes it a little bit different from like they're all behind it type of conspiracy. So ratings. First book. Four and a half out of five gears. Very good. Not perfect, but very good. Very enjoyable. Very original. Second book. I would go down to three and a half to four because it's so long. <laughs> and I, you know, got a little tired of it at times. But in general, good. Third book, five out of five. Completely exciting. Nail biting. Couldn't put it down. <laughs> Had to find out whether Juliet was going to survive. <laughs> and what's going to happen to Donald. Will he make amends? Will he atone for his sins? All that kind of thing. So this has been, with spoilers, <laughs> my review of the three main books of the Silo series by Hugh Howey, which has been made into a very successful and critically acclaimed uh, streaming series on Apple TV+, Plus, which I have not seen. <laughs> so this is from the perspective of somebody who's only read the books. Please let me know if you have seen it or if you've read the books and if you've got comparisons that, from the two. It looks to me like the, they've changed a few things of the plot. So hopefully they're fairly faithful to it. Please also give me any suggestions you might have for future shows. Like, subscribe, and share so we can help spread the good steampunk word. Also, check out my books on Amazon. As always, I will have a list of links in the description and I got to sell a few of these <laughs> so I can afford to buy an Apple TV Plus subscription and actually see this thing. For now, this is Steampunk Desperado saying adios amigos from the Steampunk Desperado channel where the past meets the future and the present is extraordinary.